that darn Cardi Jew? They're making us ravenous look horrible. If you've enjoyed this program, please click like and subscribe. Shalom, this is Yorub and Emmett with another exciting Torah Watchman adventure and learning about all things Jewish, learning about other world religions, learning about history and how all the connection points across time over the thousands of years that humanity has, has essentially has risen from the dust of war and conflict to where we are in the 21st century. How do we can hopefully how do we hope to connect all the dots from everything that's happened in the past that we just completely cannot connect to, right? You just consider how old um, the nation of Israel goes back as one of the oldest nations still on the planet, you know, next to the Egyptians, next to the, the Asian people, next to the Buddhists, you know. We're talking about ancient civilizations, we're talking about ancient societies, we're talking about pagan religions and everything else. But what does that have to do with Jews living in the diaspora in the United States and our American traditions, right? Well, there's a lot of traditions and holidays and festivals and things that we essentially take for granted. Now, for me as an Orthodox Hasidic Jew, our high holidays is clearly outlined uh, throughout the uh, five books of the Torah, primarily in the books of uh, Numbers, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. And, you know, we have both major and minor holidays too. And in some Orthodox circles, we also celebrate some of the secular holidays in Israel as well. But in parallel with our celebration of our holidays, which is based on the Holy Holy uh, Sidras, the scriptures, <clears throat> throughout the Jewish Bible, you have other world religions as well celebrating their various holidays too. Now we want everyone to be full of Semka, right? We want everyone to be happy. But does, does, um, does everyone know where the roots are um, for the holidays they uh, consider to be important for them and what they pass on to their children. Now, I, the Lord, my God, laid on my heart today for some reason. I was looking at the calendar. Uh, that we just finished uh, the uh, holiday of Sukkot. Um, we just um, finished uh, the holiday of Simchat Torah. And we're already thinking about Hanukkah, just, you know, the Festival of Lights, just around the corner, not too long not too many uh, weeks uh, or months until that time either. But you know what's interesting? There's a lot of connection points for the uh, Sukkot, uh, the, uh, fe the festival of tabernacles or booths per se. It's a harvest festival as well. What's uh, interesting in Sukkot, uh, at least in the diaspora, we stop praying for dew on the ground You know, each morning. We pray and hope to have a strong north wind blowing in rain off the coastal areas like in Israel. Uh, you know, rain can make it or, or break it for people living in, in Eretz Israel when it becomes very hot in the summer months. If you don't have enough rain in the mountains, um, uh, you don't have enough water for the aquifers and streams and rivers like the, the Jordan River, 
uh, the Galilee and the Dead Sea were just, just starving for water. But anyway, not germane. But you know on your calendar, you can probably look at that in your Gregorian calendar and find the holiday as, as in America has made lots of money and has sold more candy than any other time of the year. It's the holiday of Halloween. Now, Christians predominantly celebrate this holiday. Uh, also do seculars. Uh, in fact, most Americans do celebrate Halloween. They either have a costume party, uh, similar to Mardi Gras, uh, or, or they, um, they go out to the bars, uh, then maybe they wa watch some uh, scary movies on TV and things of that nature. Um, of course, if you have small children, you take them trick-or-treating, uh, you know, but, you know, in this unsafe society, you know, um, several years ago, I heard about razor blades and bags of candy. You, ha you have to be very careful these days for your children, right? But, you know, what do you tell your children to be true? How do you explain to your child, if you are an evangelical, if you're a Christian, if you're a Protestant person, Southern Baptist or whatever, or even Roman Catholic, how do you explain to your child that you need to have a jack-o'-lantern on the, on the front step of your house, lit with a wickedly face there, a smiling face there, with maybe a candle or something in it, or uh, what I've seen, uh, Halloween uh, um, decoration parties, and when I used to live in Charleston, South Carolina, uh, there were not a lot of Orthodox Jews living on my block there. Uh, there was a lot of uh, the, the HOA sponsored these big Halloween decoration party contests. You know, if you decorate your house uh, as spooky as possible with the lights and, you know, uh, tombstones and skeletons and monsters and things that go bump in the night, then you get a nice prize, right? Um, but, you know, they have consternation and problems when I decorate my house from my Jewish holidays. And I fought with the HOA, and I won that battle, not Jermaine. But, you know, Halloween today uh, is an American holiday. You don't get off for it. It's not a federal holiday. But it is an ancient holiday that's rooted uh, in Great Britain, uh, going back to the, the, uh, the Celts. The Celts, you know, in uh, Britain uh, 2,000 years ago. Yeah, it, it is that old. It goes back during that time. So please bear with me. Um, I learned a lot of things by doing some research on this, and uh, I hope that you can learn some things too. But the question is, you know, not every single Christian celebrates Halloween. Uh, they kind of ignore it. They, uh, they uh, pull down their shades. They darken their porch light, and they don't even give candy out. Um, depending on how old you are, you may just be tired of the holiday. But, you know, trick or treat, if you don't give candy to some kids, I remember in the South, people would throw rolls of toilet paper up in your trees and make a huge mess, or they throw eggs at your car, you know. And, you know, that's vandalism. But anyway, listen, I'm not an old fogey, and to each their own. As long as it's a safe uh, ho a holiday for your kids and it's happy and all of this kind of thing. But the glorification of death is where I draw the line with that. As an Orthodox Jew, I do not celebrate Halloween. <laughs> and you can imagine how scary it can be in Borough Park when people come in and Gentiles, non-Jewish people come there and do trick-or-treat in there. Um, or Orthodox rabbis essentially tell their Jewish uh, congregation, stay, um, either leave home during this time. It's a very scary time for some Jews because Jews are actually picked on, anti-Semitism increases, yes, yes, it increases during uh, Halloween. Well, let's get started. Halloween's origins, again, date back to ancient Celtic festivals known as Samhan, Samhan, Samhan. Um, it's pronounced actually Soin, Soin. Um, I never heard of that word before. It's interesting, but that is the name that predates the name Halloween. Um, the area uh, was, was in Ireland, you know, the uh, United Kingdom and Northern France uh, were governed by the Celtic, Celtic people, the Celts, um, but before there were Anglo-Saxons. Um, and this was a uh, ancient, ancient holiday going back 2,000 years ago. And they celebrated the beginning of their new year, November 1st, believe it or not. 
Uh, so they had a different calendar system that even uh, the Roman Empire had with the uh, Gregorian system, or much less the Jewish people. So this day marked the end of summer and the harvest and the beginning of the dark and cold winter. Okay, during 2,000 years ago and uh, ancient Europe, very superstitious, okay? The Vikings had their gods, uh, the... Uh, the uh, Anglo-Saxons, the Celts had their gods. Many people had different gods and believed in evil spirits and believed in and, uh, demigods and believed in fairies and pixies and elves and leprechauns and all these other mischievous beings and everything else. And they, they had to explain why life dealt you a bad card, okay? If people, if you have disease and pestilence, if your crops fail, uh, total lunar eclipse, total s solar eclipse, um, war and famine and all this, they ha they explained that because they didn't understand empirical method, didn't understand science, they didn't understand uh, astronomy and other things like this and cause and effect, the physical laws of the universe. So they relegated that out to spirits and other things else that were pretty much had command and control of um, the human race. So this day marked the end of the summer. Celts believed that that on the night before the new year, the boundary, the very thin boundary, interdimensional boundary between the world of the living and the dead became very porous and blurred. So in between the twilight, uh, twilight you know, of dawn, or, or sunset, you have that veil and that curtain, you know, uh, you know where the light recedes and darkness comes and creeps, creeps, um, creeps forward. Um, there's a lot of uh, superstitious nature of that kind of thing. Okay, so they believe that during this time, once per year, on the night of October 31st, uh, which they celebrate uh, Sowen. Uh, they believed that they could encounter their ancestors, you know, and they were both good, uh, evil, and, and, and good ancestors, you know. You had local cemeteries and things like that, and they actually believed that their ancestors uh, would, would be able to cross the plane of the uh, dead to the plane of the living, okay? Sounds like uh, an episode in the uh, famous uh, 15 seasons of the, of the show, TV show on CW known as Supernatural. This incidentally was written, I don't mean to get off topic, was written by Jews and Kabbalists, uh, Christians and other people. It has all kinds of proliferal uh, pagan uh, rituals and, and legends and things like that in that Supernatural kind of show there was extremely popular. Um, um, and in fact, I know some Jews that watch it. In fact, my wife and I have watched it too because they talk even about Jews and golems. But anyway, not germane. People are naturally interested in ghosts and goblins and things that go bump in the night. People are very scared about it and you avoid it completely or, um, or, or you're curious. Some people, you know, they go on these big tall roller coasters and the adrenaline rushes and everything else. Or jumping, or jumping off a cliff into the ocean, or jumping out of an airplane. Some people like to be scared to death. I'm not one of those people. I don't like high places. I don't like roller coasters. Um, you know, haunted houses and all this, being scared and everything else. Uh, you know, it doesn't really do much for your soul and your nafash. It doesn't really help you to be elevated, per se, in righteousness. But it is what it is. It's part of human nature. It's a darker part of human nature. Now, moving forward, um, again, uh, there was trouble with damaging crops. Okay, sometimes if you had a wheat harvest and you hope that it's dry, then suddenly you have a strong rain and then it creates mold and rot on the wheat and you lose the harvest, you know, that can cause starvation. That can cause famine. And they blame the supernatural creatures during this transition point in their calendar system 2,000 years ago in, Great, in Britain um, that, that was the interaction of the dead. So in addition to causing trouble to crops, the cells thought 
that the presence of otherworldly spirits even made it easier for the Druids or Celtic priests or made it more difficult. It also helped them to make predictions about the future. You know, when I, when I was active duty in 2012 in the Air Force, I was so surprised. I was at in San Antonio at Lachlan uh, Air Force Base, and they actually had a setup there. It looked like uh, Stonehenge, uh, Stonehenge uh, you know. The famous circle of pillars uh, of rocks. Well, I asked about this, and it was in support of the Wiccan religion. I mean, uh, this uh, these holidays, uh, like uh, uh, Solhen, as as is a is a is a, um, a very important religious holiday for Wiccans and and Druids. So it's very interesting for people entirely dependent on the volatile natural world. These prophecies were an important source of comfort during the long dark winter. You know, today we have, we, we have some people joke about the farmer's almanac because it's based on Naga cultures, based on lunar cycles and the sun, and all the predictions about the weather. A lot of that came out of that, believe it or not. So you know. Uh, people did not understand why the winter was was darker. You had less hours of sun than you had in the spring and summer months. They just didn't understand it. So, but these uh, druids that were more educated, more literate than the, the country folk per se, and they probably understood aspects of astronomy. They definitely understood the uh, the eclipse line of the ecliptic, the zodiac. You know, Aquarius, Virgo, Leo, Sagittarius, and other constellations along the ecliptic, and they had their own rituals and belief systems of that too. So, uh, what does this have to do with Halloween? Well, just bear with me. So, Druids uh, build huge sacred bonfires. Um, uh, they do this today. Uh, Druid, uh, being a Wiccan, being a witch, um, you know, uh, the so-called white witches and and uh, black witches and evil witches and good witches casting spells, love charms and all this. All of this was going on 2,000 years ago in Britain, okay? So during this time, uh, you may call a druid or a Wiccan to come and bless your crops so that uh, it would come to harvest without any harm. Uh, you may ask a druid to come and bless your pregnant wife and make sure the child would not come to harm because there's a lot of a lot of uh, premature births in that time and, and a high infantile uh, death rate, you know, during this time as well. So the celebration was over. These bonfires are actually uh, mandatory. I mean, you had to have these bonfires in a celebration and ha keep a happy face, even though in very dark uh, 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 winters and things of this nature, the ominous aspect of that, you have spirits crossing their worldly domain to our worldly domain. Um, uh, people uh, wore costumes, typically consisting of animal heads and skins. This is where the costume uh, wearing uh, uh, ritual started during that time. Now, the ancient um, Soan. A Celts mark, marked this holiday most significantly in four quarterly fire festivals, and again, these were mandatory, taking place at the midpoint between the fall equinox and winter. And you know, we just entered the fall equinox here, and we're already thinking about winter equinox as well. So this is context in this season right now. So during this time of year, Hearth fires in family homes were left to burn. You hear, hear about the hearth, where the hearth is. That's actually where you burn the wood and things of that nature, uh, the old stone fireplaces. I actually had an aunt, a great aunt, that lived in a stone house. It's built of stones. It's amazing. But anyway, when the harvest work was complete, celebrants joined with a druid priest to light a community fire using a wheel that would cause friction and spark flames. Okay, the wheel was considered as a representation of the sun and used along with prayers. Okay, this seems kind of barbaric and... Uh, <laughs> and uh, hebronistic or paganistic compared to 21st century people but you know all um, I would say most of the Roman Catholic holidays Christian holidays have an ancient pagan root Halloween is just one of these holidays of many that I'm picking on anyway bear with me this is not my opinion I'm reading to you a report of my findings okay moving through early texts present that Solhan uh, as a mandatory celebration lasting three days and three nights and it was mandatory in fact people in the military 
uh, got in trouble if they if they uh, would use their weapons or would go out and fight. In other words, if they were not doing things that produce happiness and celebration, uh, it could be a capital offense, okay? So uh, some documents mention six days of drinking alcohol in excess, typically more meat or beer and gluttonous feasts, a uh, big feast, a uh, big uh, uh, festival including uh, big bonfires, uh, emulating fireworks and things of this nature. So it sounds like people were having a lot of fun, uh, a lot of debauchery and things of this nature. Um, but, you know, this is what was going on during that time. And this was helped to lift, to alleviate their spirits during an ominous time where you had less hours of sunlight in the winter months than you had in the spring. Of course, you can imagine if you were a child in the uh, 2,000 years ago, not even talking about the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, uh, it's a pretty scary time, right? So during this time, the uh, Celts believed the barrier between the worlds was breachable during um, during that transitional point between October 31st and November 1st. So we said this. So when they so they prepared offerings that were left outside villages and fields for fairies and something called uh, sits, if I'm pronouncing it correctly. I'm talking about some of the monsters, some of the supernatural entities and beings that they actually believed that they interacted with. You know, they had mushroom circles. They used believe uh, fairies dance in them and all this. So the people would actually leave out uh, aspects of their harvest uh, to appease the fairies and these beings so they would not create mischievous and bad fortune uh, for them. Again, very superstitious society back during this time. So it was expected that the ancestors might cross over during this time, so they were enticed to uh, communicate with them as well. And they were also concerned that uh, fairies might kidnap these uh, disembodied spirits as well and cause misharm to people's ancestors in the local cemeteries. Um, um, a lot of the bonfires were close to these cemeteries uh, uh, during that time. And, you know, some of the traditions in America, it sounds gory and gothic. People go to cemeteries and old churches and places like that uh, and have bonfires to this day. Uh, the uh, story of uh, Ichabob Crane, the headless horseman and all this, well, this came from from Lady uh, Gwen, a headless woman dressed in white who chases night wanderers and accompanied by a black pig. Um, she was riding on a horse, uh, uh, including a shape-shifting creature, uh, a apuka, whatever. <laughs> you know, I, I have not heard of this before. But uh, these, I can go on and on. There's a lot of detail here, but I won't. I'm just trying to cover the high points here. So they believed in these fairy creatures. They believed in these entities. They made up legend and stories, and they became uh, their cultural myths, and they actually became their reality and their worldview. There were a lot of mythology of the Celts people, uh, for Soen and Halloween. Um, uh, one of the most popular stories, and I'll just tell you one, is the second battle of Mag Torred, who portrays the final conflict between the Celtic Pathon um, Pathion, known as the Tuatha de and an evil op oppressor is known as the Fomor. Okay, uh, uh, I don't know these words. The myths state that the battle unfolded over a period of uh, Darren Sohen. There are many adventures and many stories. Uh, in fact, uh, to this day, people watch, again, scary movies that tell scary stories. You know, um, I was raised uh, Grimm's fairy tales and all these things. My wife has told me about the Baba Yaga, about the witch and everything else, and uh, Russia that she grew up around with, uh, Grandfather Frost and everything else in that secular society. Now, it, leading up to the Middle Ages, you know, eventually um, the Roman Empire invaded invaded uh, uh, Britain. Um, then uh, probably I would say by the uh, third century, third or fourth century, uh, they invaded uh, Britain, and they uh, they uh, assimilated with their gods and spirits and things of that nature, their pagan rituals, and then they uh, they acclimated that uh, within the Roman Empire's culture. That's what they did. Uh, the Romans they really did not invent anything new. They improved and polished and refined things of old. Um, in the Middle Ages, 
um, the jack-o'-lanterns became to appear. Uh, you, saw, you could see in these Gothic churches throughout Europe, there's even some in America, you have gargoyles on these Roman Catholic cathedrals. It's just scare off these evil spirits uh, during this transitional point between October 31st and November 1st. There were a lot of Irish myths about the jack-o'-lantern. There's something called the Dumb Supper during that time, which food was consumed of celebrants. But after inviting ancestors to join in, you know, spirits of the departed, giving families a chance to interact with their spirits and talking to the dead. I don't know what you think about uh, communicating with the dead, having seances, crystal balls, talent cards, and all these things. I'll get to this later, but these things were st are strictly forbidden in Orthodox Judaism. I'll get to that in a moment. Now, Christian um, Sohan, believe it or not, Christian Sohan actually became Halloween. So the first attempt was by Pope Boniface in the 6th century. He moved the celebration uh, to May 13th and specified a day of celebrating saints and martyrs, uh, departed saints, and the fire festivals of October and November. However, he did not end with that decree. <coughs> Excuse me. He did not decry these pagan uh, fire festivals, okay? Uh, he actually renamed uh, uh, Sohan to All Saints Day, uh, which would follow into November 2nd, okay? So this is Pope Gregory uh, taking ownership of this pagan holiday based in, in, in Celt myths, uh, mythology, uh, mythology and pagan rituals going back 2,000 years ago. Okay, now we're talking about Halloween, or Hallow's Eve, uh, which contained much of the traditional pagan practices between uh, being adopted in the 19th century in America. So trick-or-treating, going door-to-door, -door, and I need to tell you about that, that ritual, giving candy, all we're told about that. Now Wicca and Sohan, Wicca, the interest in w Wiccan, uh, wi uh, witchcraft, druids, and things of this nature. Uh, a man uh, who was a Wiccan, he was known as a druid. A woman who was a Wiccan was known as a witch. This became a popularity in the 1980s. When I worked for the government uh, several years ago, uh, they advertised all the different holidays for the government uh, workers, federal workers, and and Solhen was one of them. Uh, uh, the celebration uh, during summer, summer uh, solstice, uh, winter solstice, and all these things are Wiccan sacred holidays for them. Okay, and actually they were noting that. And again, I told you at an Air Force base of that they had something set up for Wiccans to worship. Okay. Uh, this isn't a constitution, freedom of religion expression, right? So, uh, in Druidic tradition, Sohan celebrates the dead with a festival on October 31st and usually features a bonfire with communing with the dead. So, the bonfire became a communion device to reach out and to attract um, uh, the dead spirits of the, of the afterlife to interact with the living, okay? So American pagans often hold music and dance celebrations called witches balls and proximity to uh, Sohan. So All Saints Day, okay? Uh, if you're Roman Catholic, especially affiliated with the Vatican and the Pope, you know what All Saints Day. You have a Catholic mass, <clears throat> Satanists have a black mass and all this. Uh, yes, I've had university training in world religions. I'm sorry. Uh, the origin of All Saints Day cannot be traced with all certainty, but it has been observed in various uh, day in various um, days in different places. A feast of all martyrs, like May 13, was very important. The Eastern Church, um, uh, according to um, Ephraim Cyrus, you know, this is uh, the third century, 373, which was determined the choice of May 13th by Pope Boniface IV, which dedicated uh, the, the Pantheon in Rome and church in honor of the Blessed Virgin and all the martyrs and by 609 to 6th century. First evidence is November 1st, the date of the celebration, a broadening of the festival to include all saints as well as martyrs occurred during the reign of Pope Gregory III, and this was 731 to 741, okay? Not really that germane, and I'm probably boring you senseless, but um, what I'm trying to show you here is a connection when ancient pagan rituals are uh, known as um, Samhain, which is a which was celebrating a transition point between uh, uh, um, 
uh, summer and autumn, okay? When the, uh, when the days uh, were, had less light, when the sun was not at the zenith anymore and kind of was at a, at a lower uh, horizon and setting point, you had less hours and the night creeped up uh, much sooner than it did in the spring, okay? So this ancient holiday was incorporated by the Holy Roman Empire, okay? So and they invaded that area. They invaded that area. Uh, I, th I'm, um, I, th I'm th I think that was actually, they invaded the area uh, probably right around that 2,000 year ago, okay? Um, that point. I'm not sure exactly the date because I know uh, uh, Emperor Hadrian had a general from Britain that came down and destroyed Jerusalem at 135 CE. So it means they had some sort of base of operations there. Okay, so long story short, what does this have to do with Karite Judaism? Well, to be frank with you, absolutely nothing, okay? Uh, throughout the Torah, it is absolutely forbidden to communicate with the dead, okay? You can read about this in uh, Viacra, Leviticus, chapter 18, verse 3, about the adulterous customs um, and the foolish customs of the Gentile community that we are forbidden to emulate the Gentile nations or the nations around us completely. We are forbidden not to... Uh, adopt their custom and their rituals with Jewish rituals and customs, okay? You can read about that in the Torah, and, I, and I've talked about this in Torah Watchmen before, that this was the last will and testament of Moshe and the ending of Deuteronomy and Davarim. He said, do not associate with the customs and rituals of the Canaanite people. This is the same thing. These admonitions still apply. Okay, we're back to to um, the Ramban again, Maimonides, um, and there's another sage by the name of Nachmanides. Both of these sages uh, talked about this between the 11th and 12th century. Uh, they talked about the nature of spirits, angels, demons, supernatural creatures, and things of that nature. In fact, I remember reading in the Talmud about being careful and being called at night in a ruin. Uh, there may be evil spirits there and things like that. Again, rabbis during the Middle Ages were very superstitious as well, and that's, and that's reflected throughout the, Kab the uh, Zohar and Kabbalah. But, you know, back to the Torah, what it says absolutely, you will not communicate with the dead. You will not associate with any, any uh, Gentile nation that, that has these practices of necromancy, uh, fortune telling. You remember Balaam the false prophet and the Midianite king and every, all the conflict with Israel during that time and all the curses. Uh, not to associate with those people at all. Okay, uh, the practices are expected to be done by Gentile custom and law but not Jewish people, okay? They're completely forbidden, and they, are, and they are considered as adulterous practice. I did a video recently about the Noahide Laws, when it says, um, you, thou shall not commit adultery against the one true God of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Yaakov. Uh, this is the same, same thing I'm talking about. Because these entities, these dark spirits and evil spirits from the from the world of, uh, of the dead and all this transition and everything else, speaking of the dead, seances, all these things, or at least attempting to do that. Now, these sages admit that it is possible to communicate with the dead, okay? There's a famous story, uh, quickly, in the First Samuel chapter 28, the witch of Endor, when King Saul was at the end of his reign, um, God was tormenting him with the adversarial spirits, dark spirits, and he uh, and the prophet of Samuel that he put all his faith and trust had departed. He had no one to talk to as a liaison to God. So what did he do? He sought out a witch who lived in the land of Endor. I'm not sure where that's at. Somewhere in Israel. And she was able to summon the departed spirit of Samuel. And God allowed this miracle to happen as a warning, as a warning to Saul. And this is the end, essentially, end of, end of his reign and kingdom, end of his life when he uh, did this, because it was absolutely an abomination what he did. You can read it in the Torah, Deuteronomy, chapter 18, 11. Again, for, further uh, for, uh, prohibit, um, prohibitions, inquiring of the dead, conducting seances, uh, otherwise attempting to communicate with those that have passed. Now, there are some Jews that actually do this. I've talked some to some Jews. And, you know, I, I have an open mind to this to the point where, you know, some people have more intuitive insight 
uh, than other people. In other words, they can feel and sense things. I don't want to get into any of that. But I'm just saying I don't re totally reject that simply because I don't understand it, because I cannot pr prove it through the empirical scientific method, and because I don't find it in the Torah. Many Christians ask Jews, uh, why don't you talk about the afterlife? Why don't you talk about, um, you know, Shamaim? Uh, why don't you talk about Shoal and Gehenna? Uh, because you know, Jews are not preoccupied with the dead or dying. Because if you live your life righteously and you know, and, you know, for 120 years, then you you have nothing to worry about. And I mean, it's it's not quantifiable. You cannot dig up uh, a dead person. Hey, Joe, tell me about the afterlife. It just doesn't work that way. And it's just the way it is. And all of it is just speculation, and superstition. I guess again, Maimonides t took approach. He said. All types of witchcraft and sorcery and communication dead are strictly forbidden. Forms invoking spirits are not only a nonsense but pagan activities. He actually did not believe in demons. Um, other rabbis actually did. Um, demons are actually lesser uh, angelic uh, entities that work for the adversary. And the adversary is a prosecuting attorney of, the, of, of humans. Okay. Oh, okay. Yes, I'm finally finished. So, if you're a Christian, you're hearing this, you know how you're hearing this, and you're thinking about celebrating Halloween, you know, a festive time of the year. Uh, who does not like uh, the change of the seasons? I love this time of year when the leaves lose the chlorophyll because you lose the sunlight and the colder temperatures. Everyone likes cooler weather, right? And as opposed to the summer, uh, you see, um, you know, uh, animals beginning to hibernate and, and start getting ready uh, for winter, all of this kind of thing. But listen, uh, as I'll encourage you, as a Christian, if you consider yourself as an Orthodox Christian, if you consider yourself as a Catholic, an Azurbic Christian, um, you know, why do you mess with this at all? Why do you, again, at this root, and I already told you, 1980s, um, Solon or Halloween or All Saints Day is actually um, worshipped and, and pr as a religious pagan ritual. Uh, it's a wicked holiday. And then Roman Catholics, like they do, I'm sorry to say this, but it is true. Roman Catholics today, which are Christians, okay, um, and there's debate among Southern Baptists if they're real Christians or not, whatever. It's not for me to judge them, but they base everything on the Holy Roman Empire that again, again, created a Frankenstein hybrid monster of bits and pieces of everyone's uh, uh, gods and rituals and superstitions and myths and incorporated that in their own, okay? Because the Roman, uh, uh, Greco-Roman world 2000, ago, 2000 years ago is a very pagan society, okay? Uh, Halloween has very pagan roots to that. Uh, a lot of Christian holidays have pagan roots too. I don't want to get into all of them. Uh, Christmas, uh, Easter, all of these are based on the Roman Catholic uh, uh, legends and traditions going back to the third century. Okay, listen. Um, don't shoot the messenger. This is all this Jew has to say about this. I'm just a simple Jew reporting to you on the information I found that I thought was uh, kind of interesting. Again, if you are an Orthodox Jew, do not try to emulate behaviors of Gentiles unless it's righteous behavior that you find among your no hides brothers and sisters. May we all say, oh man, Yarv and Emmett signing out. Please share and personal notify uh, so that you can get the word out that I'm here and I'm interested, invested in truth and in that truth, okay? Take care of yourself. God bless you. Enjoy the fall season. Enjoy your life as much as you can. Shalom.